And both of these players already with the draw. Not too surprising. Mm -hmm. See them this deep in the tournament uh, playing these two decks. Obviously on the slower side. I feel in this matchup that Esper has a bit of an edge because Thoughtseize is so potent. Uh, I agree with you. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, because it depends on the amount of counter spells that the blue-white deck has, because uh, Thoughtseize, you know, a lot of the time your plan is to cast a Thoughtseize and then try to resolve Aetherling. However, um, if the blue-white control deck has a bunch of counter spells, it's very, very difficult to do, as Chandler is going to play Azorius Guildgate to start things off here. And I feel that was sort of the thing that was pinning down Blue-White's prevalence for a long time was just a lot of Esper with multiple main deck thought seizes was very commonplace early on in the season. And it's very hard to build a non-black control deck when that's a common thing. See Temple of Enlightenment here for Chandler. He'll leave the card on top. Colin's going to untap. See a lot more Esper uh, this weekend than expected. It's true. I think that the black removal spells, particularly Doomblade and Ultimate Price, are much better now than they were a month ago. And mm -hmm. that's a pretty strong incentive to add black to the deck. Mute Vault here from both players as Collins will start turn number four here with a Thought Seize. Chandler's going to show an Elspeth, an Aetherling. Uh oh. An Aetherling, a Sphinx's Revelation, a Tension Sphere, a Verdict, and a couple of lands. And each player only has one Aetherling in their deck, so if he, uh, he spikes an Aetherling, this gets interesting. Yeah, you can still win the game with, with either one of your Planeswalkers, but that's much more challenging than, than trying to win with Aetherling. Decision looks like it's probably going to be between Revelation and Aetherling. Yep. But the shields are down here for Collins. Let's see what he's going to take. Ace? Yep. He's going to take the All-Star in the matchup. It is Aetherling. Yeah, there is some risk here in case, uh, you know, Charles is playing a build with multiple Aetherlings, but that's very uncommon in blue control list. It's almost certainly just the one. Planes there from Collins. He passes the turn back. Chandler going to play an island. Pass the turn back. And again, as we have said many times when we watch Revelation matchups, it's all about hitting your land drops. That's the yeah. most important thing, first and foremost. What is noteworthy here is Charles, Charles Chandler is playing with one main deck copy of Elixir of Immortality, so he does have a way to circumvent okay. all of this. That is a big deal. It's still a lot of trouble. This is not a good spot for, for Charles to be in, but it's not nearly as bad as if he had no Elixirs in his list. Cyclozorius Charm is what Chandler's going to do. On Collins end step, we'll take a draw. There's this, hey, it looks like a Celestial Flare in his main deck. Does pass the turn back over to Collins. Going taps his Water Grave. Who will be the first player to miss a land drop? That is the question. That is phase one of the game. Yes. As it requires, that player is then required to start casting spells at a certain point. Is it Justin Collins? Looks like he's going to cast a spell, so maybe the answer is yes. This feels like a Jace to me, and it is. So Jace Architect of Thought's going to show up. We'll see how he wants to use it. It's going down. So three cards coming. There's a Godless Shrine, a Temple of Deceit, and a copy of... It takes a lot to stump me. What card is that? Go to the tape. Yeah, that's where I'm headed. Revoke Existence. Okay, he hasn't yeah. made that copy of Revoke. I'm used we're to seeing the older version. Yeah, we're, we're starting to see one main deck Revoke Existence pick up in popularity in decks mm -hmm. like Orzov, like Blue White Control, and like Esper. So Collins again, it's going to take the pile of two cards, of course. Whichever one does have a land is very appealing. Collins has not played a land yet. There's an untapped Goblet Shrine, so he's able to block with Mute Vault if necessary. And yeah, this allows him to protect his Jace. One thing here that's of note, um, Collins doesn't have a ton of blue mana, actually. He's got, you know, a couple Goblet Shrines out there, Mute Vault and things of that nature. Doesn't actually have a lot of lands to produce blue. Yeah, the blue mana check is really important because normally the fireworks start when someone is able to do X with Counterspell Backup, and then how much blue mana each player has in play starts becoming a really important thing. Mewdwalk gets fired up. Looks like it's probably going to go after Jace here in a moment. We'll see. Let's see if Collins maybe has a removal spell here, like a Doom Blade. He has two of those in his main deck, or if he's just going to be on blocking duty. Getting to cash in a Doom Blade on a Mewdwalk at oh. this stage of the game would be a huge win for Justin. Yeah. Mutavolt's going active. Here it comes. And he just lets Jace go. Basically saying, I can't afford to lose my Mutavolt. I need this card. It's also a risk of turning on various reactive tricks in Charles's hand, too, like Celestial Flare, like Azorius Charm, that he may not want to trade with mm -hmm. there. So, Collins, do you have a seventh plan? We're going to begin... Looks like we might see a discard spell. I'm not quite sure. Going to fire Mutavolt, so we're getting aggressive. 
All right. That is a uh, that's gonna be a beaten right there. Celestial flare. This is dissolved. So yeah, now we're just fighting over some weird things here. Yeah. You know, and this doesn't really happen a lot in this matchup. Right. This is a pretty big win for Charles here. It does open the door for something big to potentially resolve. Yeah. And getting to trade, getting you know the number of counters in each player's deck is also a critical thing, and so getting to trade like that is just really awesome for Charles. Yeah, trading a dissolve for a celestial flare in this matchup is all sorts of win. You see Jace Architect of Thought drawn here for Chandler, among other options that he does have in his hand. He's doing, again, a nice job of hitting his land drops. Now he's going to drop Jace down. Could have dropped Elspeth this turn. Chose not to. So three and four. There's your Jace. It's going to tick on down. Here's a Mutavolt. There's a Faded Retribution. And that's another copy of Mutavolt. So we'll see how Collins opts to split these. Probably going to get a Mutavolt and a Faded Retribution here because I don't think Justin can afford to give him two copies of Mutavolt. And I like doing this instead of landing the Elspeth here. There's such a good chance that Justin has Detention Sphere in hand that I'd rather sort of incrementally gather more resources and then try to win the game incidentally rather than run this Elspeth out there, which likely just gets Detention Sphere and then life goes on. Yeah, sure. See Mutavolt there for Chandler. Pass the turn back. Colin's going to play Temple of Enlightenment to start his turn. Take a look at the top card. And that's, that's critical for Justin, as you mentioned, just blue mana is a pretty significant bottleneck that he has right now. Yeah, it being blue mana and it just being a land. You yeah. Know, two check marks. Anything else for Collins to do on this turn? You can see Charles with revelations in his hand, so I really like this game of that he's playing of just wearing Justin out of resources to fight over things. It looks comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Looks really, really comfortable in the control mirror as far as what he's trying to accomplish. There's a detention sphere. He's going to consult his hand really quickly here. Yeah, there goes Jace. And as you mentioned, the likelihood of Collins having an attention sphere is going to be pretty high anyway. So maybe saving Elspeth for a little later is always a good idea. Yeah, just get your card advantage while you can. And then, you know, later on, you can try to run the Elspeth when uh, Justin is less likely to have things to fight over it. D sphere the draw here for Chandler. And now he's weighing in. Thinking about if this is uh, if this is time to maybe pull the trigger on Elspeth, maybe just keep getting in there with Mutavolt. It's got a lot of different things he can do, especially playing against an Esper player. Uh, things are a little bit different here because of spot removal. Yeah. Now, the risk here is, you know, if this Elspeth, if something bad happens to this, then Charles is actually starting to run out of ways to win the game. Yeah. At that point, it is, we are looking at Elixir or Bust most likely, or winning with Mutavolt somehow, which is not easy to do. So. Maybe a main phase rev. Yeah, I think Charles is play, taking a pretty conservative approach here, in part because he does not want to have something bad happen to this Elspeth right now and then have to basically resolve Elixir of Mortality to win the game. Also, look at the mana that Collins has up. You know, only a single blue, so no no need to worry yourself of Dissolve. And, you know, he can opt to play around Syncopate, but Syncopate really isn't the card that Esper Control decks play. Yeah. So, as a result, he's going to resolve the Sphinx of Revelation, draw five cards, the Syncopate among them for Chandler. He'll probably have to go discarding here in a moment. But he does start off with a land drop. And he's just going to pass the turn back. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So he's got a couple yeah. cards he got to discard. There goes Verdict. I he, I'm just going to discard another Verdict. Okay. I was curious to see if maybe he would discard uh, Faded Retribution. Yeah. So Faded Collins, Re Collins will take a draw. Yeah, Faded Retribution, maybe he wants to save as in case there's a random Obsidat in Justin's deck or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice to have a hedge against yeah. random stuff. So we'll see what Justin's going to try to do. But I, I think Charles right now is doing a very good job of just generating just generating more raw resources. Yeah. Skiing through his deck a little bit faster. Obviously, life totals in this particular matchup don't matter too much. Collins did do something important in this game, which was thought sees away Aetherling. But as you mentioned, Elixir Immortality is hiding out in Chandler's deck list. So again, not the end of the world. Also have to admire the pace of play here from Chandler. Again, he looks like he knows exactly what he wants to be doing over the course of this game. Yeah. And so here's a divination from the blue white control player. Kind of draw a mutable and an island. So land drops are not going to be a problem. There is an island. Taking a look at his hand, a bunch of detention spheres. That Elspeth is still in the grip. A lot of cards there. Yep. I think, again, Charles is still not really in a position to have to do anything proactive as he is the, the one with more land drops. Mm -hmm. Just going to discard a D sphere and pass the turn back over to Collins, who will untap those three lands. He'll take a draw. 
And we'll see what he's going to be working with. Separating out some of his blue mana. Yeah, that's what I was say. Blues from non-blues, perhaps? Looks like we might see a Jace here. And that's what we do see. So Jace Archer take a thought here from Collins. We play some of the stack. Chandler has so many cards in his hand. Of course, Chandler has seven. Yeah. Chandler may not want to fight over this because he's very close to having to discard anyway. Mm -hmm. And this allows him to just cast a Detention Sphere next turn. Temple of Enlightenment, a Doomblade, and an Elspeth are the cards. Elspeth put by itself. Not sure how much Chandler actually cares about that, but I do like the split there of just immediate Elspeth versus, mm -hmm. you know, kind of making it as though, okay, I really care about Elspeth. So it's that versus the other cards. Even the other cards aren't great, but one of them was a land, which is important. And you rarely see elixirs in Esper lists. It's much more common in blue white lists. Mm -hmm. And so Charles is also correctly identifying that Justin may not have, again, that many ways in his deck to actually win the game. And they are of very high value here in the mirror match. Looks like Mutabolts are going active now. The goal here is to take out a Jace, it looks like. Both of them are going to go that way. So there goes Jace. Doesn't have to use a D-Sphere to do it either. And Chandler, I believe that's going to end his turn as Collins is going to cautiously untap, and now he's been given the green light. And now there is Fated Retribution. I think uh, Collins is asking Chandler what it does. Right. Obviously, as he knew it was already in his hand. For those of you not that familiar with, you know, official tournament policy, you can ask a judge at any time what the text is of any card. They can come over and show it to you. So uh, Charles, they're just shortcutting, uh, not requiring a judge to come over. And there's Jace again. Can suffer the same fate from Mutavolts. So Chandler's got that syncopate in his hand. Pulls the attention spheres forward, things of that nature. Does he want to syncopate this? Is it worth having a fight over? The answer is no. Jace takes down. Here's a hero's downfall. Temple of Plenty and a Sinister's Revelation. Pretty easy split here. Rev versus. Yeah. And, you know, syncopate is really interesting because a lot of times in control matchups it's not very good, but it's so good against the card Sphinx's Revelation. Yeah, and it, all, all these games eventually come down to resolving something fairly expensive. And that's part of the reason that Elixir of Immortality is so powerful. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a cheap way to win the game. Aetherling is quite powerful, of course, but it is a lot of mana, and you're often playing into counter spells and exposing yourself to risk by committing that much mana to your main phase. And Collins looks like he's just going to pass the turn back after the Jace and a little bit of Scry action. So Chandler takes a draw. It's a dissolve. Counterspells are, of course, quite good in this matchup. He's going to go firing up. Looks like a couple of Muta Vaults here. A little surprised at the tapping, just because he's using an island instead of a planes here. You know, that could come back to hurt him a little bit. The shields are relatively low for how many lands are in play, only five mana being yeah. available. But he's going to go after the... Uh, Going to go after Jace with all three Mutavolts. And I think we're reaching a point pretty soon where do you see a hero's downfall into Mutavolt here, that Charles is actually going to be able to start attacking Justin with those Mutavolts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, where oh, are yeah. you? Oh, those Mutavolts are working overtime. They're controlling Planeswalkers, and then they'll start going to the life total. Let's see what Colin's going to do on this turn. Both players, a lot of lands in play, of course, as we are in a Revelation Mirror. Almost 36 minutes left in the round, so pretty good pace so far. So oh. it looks like we're going to go for Aetherlink. Oh. oh, it's going to be Elspeth, excuse me. The pace of play so far has been great. Yeah. That's a Dissolve. Could Dissolve back. And he will. This is a really good opening for Syncopate, it feels like. Uh, and that's exactly what's going to happen. The question, of course, is do you fight over Elspeth or do you wait for Aetherling? You know, we obviously see that he's opted to fight over Elspeth. Syncopate dissolve, all that good stuff. Stop dissolve is going to resolve. The scry will resolve here for Chandler. You see both players are going to be organizing the stack, all that good stuff. So dissolve is going to be removed from the game. And then Elspeth is going to go in the graveyard via, via the dissolve. 
And now Chandler gets to untap. The shields are completely down. So you see him untap pretty quickly. Take a draw here. Draws a dissolve. And dissolve's great here. Charles, you know, he was he took a pretty aggressive line that turn, successfully fought over Elspeth, but his shields were largely down. He had no counter spells to protect himself from a straight Aetherling or something that Justin could resolve next turn. So picking in another counter spell is, is really critical. Really interesting attack here where Chandler opts to, instead of resolving Aetherling, just go in with two Mutavolts, and he wants to clock him that way instead. Again, the shields were down, so he had the opportunity to resolve Aetherling, if he, or excuse me, resolve Elspeth if he wanted to, and he chose not to. And now we're going to see a little bit of Mutavolt oh. Mutavolt action. Get you for two, put you down to 19, Chandler. Justin clocking back there is very aggressive. Yes, it is. That's got to give Charles some pause here. Charles drawing a divination for the turn. You see him organizing his mana a little bit here. Got a whole bunch of it, obviously. As we are well into the late game now. See what he wants to do. Looks like he probably wants to fire at Mutavolt again. I think he wants to lead off with Divination. Okay, that's what he's going to do. So he's going to start by drawing two. Hollowed Fountain and Hollowed Fountain. Going to play one of them untapped. Go down to 17. And Charles looks like a very experienced blue-white control player. He is not thinking at all, but that Hollowed Fountain can immediately came into play untapped. Yeah. You see, he's still getting very aggressive here with Mutavolt. Well, I definitely like Charles being the one getting aggressive with Muta Vaults here. Oh, there's a Doom Blade. Are you going to try to take care of the other one? With something like a Hero's Downfall. Hero's Downfall actually has the utility in this matchup due to Jace, Elspeth, stuff like that. So it's not just reserved for Muta Vault, and yeah. the other one's going to come across. Justin didn't want to quite pull the trigger there because, you know, he might not have an answer to a follow-up Elspeth in that world. Mutavolt coming in again for Justin. Going to put Chandler down to 15. Mighty aggressive, but I like it. And he does pass the turn back, so Colin's going to untap, or excuse me, Chandler's going to untap those lands. He's still got that Elspeth, couple of detention spheres hanging out. Revelation was the draw. It wouldn't surprise me to see Charles initiate some amount of action on this turn, trying to run Justin out of resources to set up this revelation. Going to play Hollow Fountain untapped. He's going to go down to 13. And what looked like a little bit of awkward move ball attack, it doesn't look so bad now. Yeah. No, Justin with some spot removal spells in his hand could afford to be uh, pretty liberal with his attacks. Dang, sis, let's do it again. Put Chandler down to 11. And there's a Watergrave tap pass turn back. Chandler, you know he's going to want to resolve Revelation. The question yes. is just for how much. It depends if he intends on fighting over it or not, if if Justin fights back. Well, let's get the answer is yes, because he did it for five and left three mana back. There's a Dissolve. There's a Dissolve on Dissolve. Now you're going to see the Revelations resolve. Four... Five. Bunch of lands, another Dissolve, and a Supreme Verdict. It's funny for as much card advantage as these decks are able to generate with Jace and with Sphinx's Revelation, that there aren't actually a lot of cards that matter. There's a lot of discarding to be done. There's a lot of spot removal and Supreme Verdicts and Detention Spheres. Now that Detention Sphere is totally dead, but it, it's Revelations is important, but it's not the end-all, be-all. And on first blush, you would just assume in a control mirror, it's, yeah, whoever draws more cards wins. Mm -hmm. But these decks are so flush with reactive cards that there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of draws that just don't really matter very much. Temple of Enlightenment, the Scry has resolved on that, so that's Chandler's land drop for the turn. You see him organizing his mana, figuring out what he wants to do here as we work our way towards 30 minutes in the round. Looks like maybe Elspeth time, finally? Seems like a reasonable spot. See the Faded Retribution in his hand. Not going to play a huge role in this matchup, of course. You see he's counting over there. Collins his lands. And there is Sun's champion. That's going to resolve. It's going to tick up, of course. Three soldier tokens will be coming momentarily. 
Here's a hero's downfall. Take care of Elspeth, of course. An expensive way to get three tokens, but you got to do what you got to do. Charles still has a discard here. And there goes Azorius Guildgate. Eh, Howled Fountain, too. Maybe. You see him counting his lands. I would be surprised to see him just discard lands over situational spells as the lands still matter. You know, it, it, it's total... The total number of resources really count, so... You know, at this point, I'm, I'm inclined to want to discard Fate of Retribution. I know we talked about before how you might be able to catch a Blood Bear or something like that, especially when you don't know exactly what your opponent's win conditions are. It just feels like the weakest card in his hand. Yeah, I do question, for example, that there are three Detention Spheres right now in Charles's hand. It feels like at least one of the lands is more valuable than the third copy. And he did, he did discard a land, not Detention Spheres, so we'll see. If that comes back to hurt him a little bit here, if he ever gets bottlenecked on mana, maybe when it's time to have a counter war, or play multiple spells in one turn. I mean, it's possible he's working on the assumption that Justin just can't kill him through all of this. There's a verdict. That'll trade with three tokens, which, sure. Charles just might be making some assumptions about the way that Justin's deck is built. Yeah. Doesn't feel that he can beat all these reactive cards. Mutaval going to come crashing in, put Chandler down to 14. Collins going to play a Hollow Fountain tap to pass the turn back. Collins doesn't have a lot of cards in his hand. Chandler does, but of course Chandler's cards are reactive at best. Because there's an Azorius Guildgate coming to play immediately. And Chandler just passed the turn back, does not attack with Mutavolt. So Collins will take an untap. He'll take a draw. And Charles also just might be playing this game in such a way to trust, try to set up his one elixir at some point. Mm -hmm. There's Jace. That is a dissolve. A little surprised to see him fight over that one. But dissolve will resolve. Take a scry. Zori's charm is the top card. He is going to put that on the bottom. As cycling as Zori's charm would do the exact same thing, of course. Yep. This way, it's free as Mutaval's going to come in for two more. Chandler's going to go down to 12. Yeah, again, I am, I am curious, as you are, about fighting over Jace there. Especially since Charles has sort of not really valued Justin's random card draw that much from yeah. previous Jaces. Plays maybe, land just passes. Maybe because he's less able to fight over it with his Mutavaults at this point. Yeah, it just seems like every Dissolve is so important now. And he's already used a bunch of them, fighting over revelations and stuff like that, where it seems like Jace is a low prior priority threat at this point. See Collins just plays a Skyland. Looks like he's going to fire at Mutavault yet again. Are we going to even this game up? And Mutavault looks like it's on blocking duty. So these Mutavaults are going to trade. And Collins will pass the turn back to Chandler, who will take a draw. It's a Jace. It's a step in the right direction. We'll see if uh, Collins fights over this if he can. He says, no, that's fine. Jace is going to take down three cards. Celestial Flare, Hollowed Fountain, Elixir of Mortality. I think one of those is going by itself. Yep. Yeah. And that's the haymaker, as silly as it sounds in this matchup. Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Feels like he's counting for Syncopate. Yep. I don't think it has anything to do with Revelation. And there is an incentive right now for Charles to get this out of, out of his hand when he can. You know, he does know about Thoughtseize in Justin's deck, so there is some risk to not casting it uh, if you have an opportunity to resolve it. He chooses not to cast it this turn. Maybe we'll see it next turn. Six mana, Elspeth. Not a huge deal for the player who has multiple Detention Spheres in hand. Yeah. As well as Jace on the table. Oh, yeah, I feel pretty that you can pretty comfortably let that one go as well as Supreme Verdict for the tokens. So Chandler says, that's fine. Here's a D-Sphere. Yeah, and I think Charles is pretty happy letting all this kind of stuff happen as it means that the coast is clear next turn to resolve Elixir. Yeah. And then that puts enormous pressure on Justin to, to find a way to win the game. And it's not even clear how many ways he has left. Yeah, with, the, with how long this game is taking, I wouldn't be surprised in the least to see maybe a 1-0-1 a, a one -oh -one win yeah. here for Chandler as this deck takes forever to actually win the game. But as long as he wins one game, he's okay. Yeah, and it is likely to be more, even more extreme after board. Sure. 
Andrew, a Andrew Cunio is smiling somewhere, that's for sure. I can promise you that. Well, were Andrew Cunio the type of man inclined to smile, he would be smiling. Yeah, good point, good point. I had forgotten. There's a different smilier version of Andrew Cunio somewhere who is now smiling. <laughs> so Elixir looks like it's in. Unsurprisingly, a syncopate would be able to defend it. Chandler really organizing his man here, putting the basics on one side, non-basics on the other. Six, seven mana. Might see a faded retro now. This is yeah. This is not a bad spot to cash that in. Yeah. Yeah. There's seven mana. This lets let some scry too as well. It's not so bad at all. And if this doesn't resolve. You know, Charles still has a little time to play around with. You know, he has his detention spheres. He gains five life off of the elixir at some point. So this doesn't absolutely have to resolve. And if it does, that's really good for him, too. I just cry, too, looking at two revelations. <laughs> kind of interesting there. I could actually see a situation where you cast Fate of Retribution with it on the stack, activate elixir, and then you get to shuffle your whole, whole deck, uh, your graveyard back in, and then scry, too. Mm hmm. Not to play mate, but something I think uh, something I think you could see happening with that. And now it's unclear if, if Justin can really slog through all of this. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason that Cunio added Elixir to the deck is he just felt like you know you need a way to be able to beat a resolve Aetherling, and that's a roundabout way to do it, which is just chaining together gigantic revelations, hitting all of your land drops, getting all your lands into play, and then you'll be fine. As now here is Aetherling. All right, well, Charles is being put to the test here. Yes, he is. Now, what's interesting here is actually we can see a syncopate. I think that Collins can pay for but it'll tap him out, and then he can just de-sphere the Aetherling. But now there's the risk. Let's say, you know, you tap out to syncopate. And Justin goes, okay, that's fine. Now detention sphere your elixir. Yep, that's very scary. So you can see that right now Charles is trying to run through the risk of this happening. Yeah, I think this is the one turn where he felt like, all right, if he doesn't have anything this turn he gets untapped, we're good to go. Yeah. But also this was part of the risk of, uh, of casting Fate of Retribution as opposed to just de-sphering the, uh, de the Elspeth and then just moving on with life. Right. You know? So there was definitely some decisions made uh, that led us to this path. And it looks like it is going to be a syncopate for five. <laughs> He's saying if you want to resolve that, it's going to cost five mana. And that gets removed. And, yeah, I think this is a revoke existence, sure. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what you talked about. Yeah. So now all of a sudden, so somehow, some way, the Aetherling was the bait spell? <laughs> <laughs> Which I've never seen happen before. So now the question is, can Charles Chandler win the game? His Aetherling is in his graveyard from a turn three Thoughtseize. Yes. And Elspeth's? One copy. We've already seen that go. Yep. He has four copies of Mutavolt. We've seen a couple of those go. He certainly, I feel like he's revved more times. Oh, yeah. He's behind on card oh, count right yeah. now. So Collins is going to untap and take his turn as Chandler just passed back. And it's time for maybe a little draw go, my friend. Revelation, the draw. Yeah, I think Justin's just going to say, I, I just don't think you have anything left. Yeah, yeah. There's the Temple of Enlightenment. I think he's furiously digging for a Muta Vault. And it, obviously, because Collins is playing Esper, he can have many answers for that because he's got sure. smart removal. I guess going ultimate with Jace would be a backdoor way to win this game if there's stuff left. I mean, we're, yeah. we're drawing pretty slim yeah. now. Maybe, uh, maybe if you're Charles Chandler, you can trick your opponent into resolving revelations. Yeah, but I don't think I, I think Justin, by letting that Aetherling go and then just revoke existing the, I mean he knows what's going on here. Yeah. I feel like that's what it feels like to me too. The draw looks like revoke, revoke existence maybe in the draw there for Chandler. And if this holds up, it feels like Justin stole this game. Yeah, that's how it feels to me, too. It, it had to be Aetherling on that turn, Yeah, I think, to actually force some action there uh, from Chandler. 
And I guess you can make the argument that you just let Aethelion resolve as inconvenient as it may be. Shuffle Elixir and try to beat him that way. Yeah, I mean, certainly with, you know, with Charles with a revelation in hand, and, you know, potentially one that he could have scried on top of his deck as well, it's there's a lot of life to play with, a lot of tools, you know? It's, it's possible you could race Aetherling from there if you assume that Justin has very little of substance left in his hand. Temple to see comes into play. Temple of the Lightman on Chandler's side. Take a draw, there's Jace. Perhaps the plusing strategy is in order. You don't see that one get the job done very often. Now he's going to consult his graveyard. We're going to be under 20 minutes here shortly. And we don't have a we don't have an ac an actual count right now, but it looks like Charles's deck is getting very slim. Oh yeah. Chase Architect with thought on the stack here. There's a dissolve, so he says you don't get to resolve that. That's a that's an interesting use of dissolve because if you believe that your opponent does not have very many conditions left, that means that you feel as though that uh that Jace is super important. It shows to revoke existence and take care of detention sphere. So now it looks like Jace is very important as Jace is going to come back in. Four counters up to five. Yeah, it's the concern, you know, again, of him going ultimate with Jace and yep. potentially stealing the game that way. There's a grip via thought sees. Spheres, revs. Yeah, you see three spheres of rev and a verdict. He's going to actually take care of a sphere instead of a rev because at this point, rev is no good. You don't need any more cards. You need cards that actually winning you the game. Chandler taking a look at his graveyard again. His lone elixir has been revoked existence. Dissolve the draw. Jace taking up. Passing the turn back to Collins. But we'll take a draw. His spell is a detention sphere. <laughs> Has to dissolve it, even though I'm sure Chandler doesn't want to. But he needs that Jace. How many cards are left? We'll ask our table spotter exactly how many Chandler has. Yeah. Now that uh, now that Justin has prompted the count, because obviously we don't, we don't want to prompt the count. Right. So now we can uh, we can we can safely ask and answer the question. The answer is nine cards left for the blue white control player. So we'll see exactly what's going on right now in response to this dissolve. So it looks like a Revan response. Thumbs up here, given from Chandler. Two, three, whole bunch. So there's some cards. Let's see if there are any good cards there, though. Anything that does anything. I thought that was a rev for three. Uh, there's a couple lands off screen. Oh, down okay. The bottom. The boards do get cluttered with lands, that is certainly true. Indeed they do. So Sphere's going to resolve. Let's see. Justin likely... All right. It's not his land drop yet, so maybe he does not have to discard this turn. Yep. So Charles trying to ride this Jace. There's a Mutavolt. Mutavolt is a little bit late now, though. I think that Mutavolt comes a couple turns ago. It might be okay. Yeah, it does give you know Charles another way to pressure Justin's life total. Yeah. Oh, there's a, well, pff, never mind. There's a Mutavolt. Take care of the Mutavolt. So. Yeah. I thought that might be a plan, and that plan's out the door now. Now, both players not really in a position to rev, and you can see the rest of their hands are just reactive cards, not a lot in the way of counter spells. Yeah. I mean, Justin has some syncopates, but it's really hard to initiate something with syncopate. Now, Justin going to count how many cards he has in his deck, so we'll, uh, we'll get the count on that. That was a new art divination. Just pass the turn back. Jace going to just draw, attack the mutable, go up to eight. 
Justin has 13 cards after the divination, so he's ahead. That's why he could afford to divinate. There's a temple. Top card going to go to the bottom. Again, multiple revs in Justin's hand that he can't really cast. Yeah, I mean, it feels like both players have exhausted all their options. And Chandler has this JSON 8. He's really hoping it can do something of relevance. Yeah. And here comes Beautiful. Oh, I like it. Yeah, that, that, that plays great. He knocks Chase down two more counters. So now I think Charles realized his mistake of I wasn't supposed to attack with Mutavault. Yeah. Because the two damage doesn't do anything. Smart play from Collins. Right. And now this is potentially a, a real big problem that Justin can find another Doomblade and, yeah. a, you know. Ends up playing a huge role. I think, you know, the other thing too is that Jason ended up taking two. Should, it only should have taken one. But I think Charles was so frustrated. He didn't, mistake, he, didn't even, he didn't even announce the Jace trigger. Now he's going to cast his Orius Charm on that Mutavolt. And see, so this is a situation where, you know, he's Azorius Charming Mutavolt, but his Mutavolt would actually beat Mutavolt in, in, in combat. Yeah. Because of the Jace trigger. But I think, you know, kind of the frustration from Aetherling being countered, <laughs> there's a really big syncopate. My goodness. Yeah, and now Mutavolt's just good to block. Yeah, and he's just, he's completely forgotten the Jace trigger, which is so favorable for him. And with the way that he, he's untapping his lands and a little bit of frustration here, you know, now he's going to ultimate Jace. He's going to go through his deck. And he's going to shuffle, not find anything. And now he's going to go through Collins' deck. And he's thinking, please have something for me to win the game with. Yeah, there's a <laughs> Hi, not you. And we know that Charles, over the course of this game, has scried a lot of lands to the bottom yep. with his uh, with his scry lands here and various scry effects. So the rest of it, the remainder of his deck is very likely lands. Yep. So Temple of Silence is going to come into play off of Jace. It's Collins's. That goes. Actually, I don't. I don't think you can take lands with that card. Mm -hmm. With Jace now. Yeah. Now Chandler is just going to concede the game. I'm sure out of frustration. And what is a very tough game to lose. Now, yeah, you see him shaking his head saying, I, I had that one. I did yeah. everything I was supposed to. Oh, yeah. I just need to resolve Elixir, which I did. And maybe I just shouldn't have fought over anything. Like, but either way, Justin Collins is going to win a game number one in what looked like a kind of a hopeless one. Yeah, no, for sure. Justin, I feel, you know, he navigated that game very well, bidding out the bidding out the fight over Aetherling to be able to get rid of that elixir and left with Charles with no ways to win the game. And of course, we'll take a look at the sideboards here between Chandler and Collins, but you take a look at that middle number that is ticking down. You can believe that game number two is probably going to start with 10 minutes. Yeah. You got to win two games in 10 minutes. Hey, I've seen stranger things happen, like Bramble Crush could cast today, but I don't know if that can happen. Yeah, and I'm, I have Charles' sideboard in front of me. Not a lot of ways to speed up his game plan here. He has a blind obedience, three last breath, two ratchet bomb, two pithing needle, an opportunity, a revoke existence, and a gate, three gain saves, and a faded retribution. I think you can pretty safely bring in the additional counter spells. Maybe he wants pithing needle. There's a lot of overlapping pieces, but there's parts where one player has a piece and you don't. Um, but quite honestly, I think things are desperate enough that it's possible Charles brings in the blind obedience. He might need to go into a faster game plan. Oh, boy. The old extort you plan? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, with under normal circumstances, I wouldn't go near that car in the mirror match. But this is we're in a different place right now. Charles needs to steal a game uh, real fast to have any prayer of, of winning this match. Yeah, we're not in anything close to normal circumstances. Yeah. As we take a look at Collins, I think for Collins, all you do right now, sideboarding, is make sure you don't lose. Yeah. That's all you do. You take a look at his sideboard. One Prognostic Sphinx, two Blood Baron of a Scope, a Two Negate, an Erebus God of the Dead, an Elixir of Immortality, two Pithing Needle, two Life Beans, or excuse me, yeah, two Needles, two Life Beans Zombies, two Devour Flesh, two Doom Blades. Um, he can sideboard in such a way to make sure that he just doesn't lose the game. Yeah, additional removal spells. He can bring in his Elixir. He, he can, you know, some Negates. He can definitely become even more passive. And as you mentioned, under normal circumstances, I think this would be a situation where he's like, okay, let's bring in two needles, let's bring in an elixir, let's bring in Erebos, a couple of negates, maybe a prognostic sphinx, maybe not, um, and kind of go that route. But I could even see bringing in Light Bane Zombie. Yeah. Just saying, okay, I'm going to go a little bit more aggressive. Yep. I have some discard spells to supplement this, but, you know, 
Now it's just just play defense. Yeah, we're in a very unique situation where time is his ally. As you see, we're very close to that 10-minute mark where we'll begin. Of course, Colin's shuffling very fast because he wants to give Chandler the opportunity to win two games if it does happen. But he is shuffling very, very quickly. And again, we're going to be at about 10 minutes when these players do start game number two. Justin Collins does win game number one. And it looks like from the way the tiebreakers have broke down, Collins wins this match. He's probably in top eight. Yeah. And you have to imagine, you know, was it even going through Charles's head at all at the point where his elixir gets revoked? Is he supposed to concede the game on the spot? I think, given that we have access to the deck list, it's I obviously think so. that, of course, that influences how we perceive yeah. it. But it's, you know, what are your odds of winning that game higher than winning two games in 30 minutes? Yeah. It's not clear to me. That's the uh, that's the really obviously the big question is yeah are, are you just supposed to pack it up and pack it in and say all right this sucks but I don't have time for this nonsense because yeah. again I don't know exactly the timestamp when that did happen but let's say it was 28 minutes in there was a lot of time left on the clock when that exchange happened yeah. because there was you know Charles there was some fighting over Jace and some turns passed where Charles is just taking up his Jace it was that was a lot of time in between revoke existence's cast on elixir mortality and Charles concedes the game yeah. a lot of time elapsed. Well, both players going to draw their seven. Chandler will be on the play here. He's taking a look at a hand that I don't think he's in love with. But he doesn't have much time to mess around here. It looks like he's just going to keep. It's almost to this point where you have to almost keep any seven because, you know, shuffling is going to take maybe too yeah, much time. Even that, even that's a lot. Yeah. Here's the thought, Steve. Yeah, and his hand's not great at all. There's a revelation. There's a gain save. There's a negate over there. Some other things. But the, the one thing that you see is the one card by the side. There's just one island. Yeah. There's not a lot of lands. And in a matchup like this, where we, as we saw in game one, it's all about hitting your land drops. But Chandler has to take just some crazy risks here. Yeah, and even this is, you know, Justin writing down the, the hand with thoughts. He's, even this is, is excruciating for Charles yeah. with the time constraints being what they are. But there's nothing malicious here, obviously. Yeah. If this were any other game, he would do the exact same thing. You know, for Charles, he's underneath the time crunch, but Justin has, doesn't have to change his pace of play to match Charles's. He just needs to play at a normal, legal pace of play. Yeah. Collins will take a draw. Pith and needle the draw here. There's a Temple of Enlightenment. Time to scry. Leaves that card on top, passes back to Chandler, who draws an island off the top, puts it directly into play. Collins will take a draw. Temple of Deceit. Time to scry. Put it on top, pass it back. Chandler will draw. It's an elixir. And this is another card. Under normal circumstances, that elixir means a lot. Yeah. But now, with, with time being what it is, Justin doesn't even have to fight over that. Yeah, no time for this nonsense. This here is a Temple of Enlightenment. Leave it on top. Pass it back. Chandler draws. It's a dissolve. Has to pass the turn back. Collins. He's going to start taking that land advantage. There's a thought seize. I think we might see a negator dissolve here. And I'm actually not a huge fan of casting Thoughtseize while your opponent is missing land drops. Same. It's especially true once it dissolves in the deck because letting them scry is a big deal. Yeah. But even setting that aside, if Charles is close to discarding anyway, then he either has to initiate action on his own turn or he has to discard anyway and you can wait until his hand gets a little bit lower to start attacking it with your Thoughtseize. And given the situation where my opponent is bottlenecked on mana, you know, I want to use Thoughtseize as a way to just resolve something. Yeah. You know, that's the card I, I lead the turn off with in a turn I want to resolve something relevant. It's not even clear what Justin would even be concerned about resolving at this point, even yeah. if Charles were to draw a land. So Charles still not has, drawn, has still has not drawn his fourth land. Got to discard revoke existence before passing the turn back over to Collins, who has six mana in play. Looks like he just drew another land. It's a watery grave. He's going to go down to 14. That's a Blood Baron of Escopa. Looks like with Counterspell backup, potentially. Here's a Dissolve attempt. There's a Negate. Take care of that. All Chandler can do is shrug his shoulders and take his draw, which, again, is not a land. Yeah, Blood Baron's pretty interesting in a lot of the post-board games because one of the first cards that a lot of people take out is Supreme Verdict. Even though you don't think of Blood Baron as being great in the mirror match, mm -hmm. it, it, the way the post-board games shape up, a lot of... Blue white players and Esper players remove what a, a lot of their theoretical answers to it. So, not great game one, but oddly gets better in the postboard games often. Mutable going active as his Blood Baron. An attack here for six, going to put Chandler down to 14. Collins back up to a healthy 20. You see a D sphere over there in Collins' hand, a couple other options as well. Doesn't really need to move very much. Just here's a needle. You see Chandler's going to use. The elixir in response to the needle. We'll find out exactly what Collins does opt to name with the needle. I think Jace would be a pretty good name right now. 
Juice Architect of Thought is certainly not a bad name. That's one of those sweet, you know, bits of baiting by Justin there. If he does nothing, then you can needle the elixir. Mm -hmm. If he does something, then you go ahead and needle something else. Jace, Anthony Ling, Elspeth, what have you. Sure. I just had to, uh, I had to assume that it's Jace Bis because... He's going to name elixir. Okay. That's fine, too. I, I like naming something that he can cast. <laughs> <laughs> As if on cue. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Justin. Well done. It's a temple of silence. That is and nice. For six. Yeah, nice. That was really good. Going to put Chandler down to 13. Needles elixir. Okay, okay, I guess, you know, maybe he draws it sometime down the line, yeah. like the following turn, <laughs> for example. Collins rolls an island off the top of the deck, passes the turn back. Going to fire at Vault again, maybe. Yeah, we are. And ignore all the stuff that we said about time constraints, because Justin might just win this game with beatdowns. Yeah, I thought he might take the delay approach, to just playing in a way that he can't lose. Here's a revelation for one. He's going to counter Whoa. that, too. That's a bold dissolve. Yeah, that is. Here's a Jace. Even though you're very well ahead, and this is I think this is an important thing to note, even if you are very far ahead, you still play appropriately. Yeah. I don't think in, in a normal in a normal circumstance, you know, he is uh, he is dissolving that. I think he'd much rather use dissolve on Jace, for example, as you see the split here, two uh, two blue white duels and a Vault. So Mutavolt's going to go to the bottom. Maybe just a touch hasty. There's Temple. I mean, it's still going to be a challenge here for for Charles to answer everything he needs to. to I, I agree. But I that agree. was an ambitious dissolve. Yeah. Charles looking at, I believe, another temple, possibly a hollowed fountain. You know, these blue white lands, they all look the same. They all do look the same. Chandler counting here, trying to figure out if he can work his way out of the situation. Leaves the card on top, pass the turn back. Colin's going to take an untap. He's going to take a draw. We'll see where Mutavault's going to go this go around. Well, there's Water here coming to play untap. He'll go down to 24. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in buying anything... Oh, no, are we going to rev up? Yes! He's at 30! Attack for 10, that is it! <laughs> so, Justin Collins with the largest Blood Baron possible will win this match two games to zero over Charles Chandler. We have seen awesome stuff today. Yeah. Exact 30? Yeah, exact, exact 30. 30.